Hi everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday Moments in Medicine Live. We are at the uh, Lauritzen Outpatient Center, or the LOC, as we refer to it here at Nebraska Medicine today, and we're talking about varicose veins. As we begin every segment, we want to remind our viewers that the information contained in these live chats is to be utilized for informational purposes only. So if you have specific questions about your medical condition or your treatment plan, please consult with your doctor directly. I'm Heidi Woodard, and I am honored today to be joined by Dr. Adam Sutton. He is a Mohs and Dermatologic Surgery Specialist here at Nebraska Medicine. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, we wanted to talk about varicose veins. I tend to wear tights so no one knows. The world doesn't know if I have them or not, but based off of my age, the fact that I'm a female, I'm sure you can make, a, make your best guess, guess as to if I'm affected or not. Um, I've got a lot of friends who knew I was going to be doing this topic today, so I'm going to rapid fire these questions at you, and um, you're answering on behalf of me and my network of, of people. Great. Great. So varicose veins, they affect more Americans than I realized until I did a little research. So what percentage of the population suffers from this? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm excited to be here today. This is a topic that I really enjoy talking about, and, and as you alluded to, you are not a alone. Uh, many Americans suffer from, from vein disease. It's estimated that somewhere between 45 and 60 percent of all Americans have some sort of vein problem or, or vein, vein issue. So this is an incredibly common issue. And when we think about what our veins do, our veins are part of our circulatory system. And so they're responsible for helping bring blood back towards our heart. And specifically in our lower extremities where we develop our varicose veins, what happens over time is that our veins can become enlarged. Mm -hmm. And then the valves that basically stop the blood flow from going in a reverse direction stop working when the valves become enlarged. Okay. So this can lead to reverse flow of blood in the lower extremities. This can lead to enlarged veins, which can lead to some of the symptoms that we have with, with varicose veins. And when they become enlarged, they do kind of look to be more on the surface. Is that when you start to notice them? Because yeah. sometimes you have pain and sometimes you don't, but... Yeah, so it depends on what type of veins you have. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking um, at, for, through an evaluation, we're looking at a number of things. Some people just have spider and reticular veins. And so those are the small veins that we see at the surface. And often those don't actually cause symptoms for patients. Although in some cases, spider and reticular veins can be associated with deeper vein disease. And then we have varicose veins, which are a little bit larger. Those are the ropey veins. Okay. Now, some varicose veins we can see on the surface of the skin, but sometimes the varicose veins are actually deeper than what we can mm -hmm. see on the skin. And so we can have significant vein problems without any changes that we can actually see. Okay, so that's important. Just because you don't see them doesn't mean that some underlying issue could be developing. So along those lines, what are some of the risk factors for developing varicose veins? That's a great question. And you already highlighted many of of them. Gender is a significant risk factor that we think about. Meaning? Females about five times more likely to develop varicose veins. Okay. Now interestingly, females are more common, uh, commonly develop varicose veins, but men actually more commonly have severe disease. Okay. So we see a lot of men with uh, varicose veins. Um, other non-modifiable risk factors are age. Over time, our veins become more elastic and so, or inelastic, and so they actually enlarge and then the valves stop working. Mm -hmm. um, so we think about those, those couple of factors. Okay. Um, we think about uh, Caucasians more common. Um, obesity is a is a risk factor. More uh, heavier weight, greater risk for for developing varicose veins. And our genetics. If our both of our parents had varicose veins, then we actually have about a ninety percent wow. chance of having varicose veins. Um, other things that we think about are our um, our lifestyle. Are we sedentary? Do we spend long periods of time just standing, not moving, or or sitting? Um, those can be all risk factors for developing varicose okay, veins. Okay, good to know. You've already answered varicose veins affect women more than men. A um, couple of my friends wanted to know, does having children increase the likelihood? Yeah, great question. And, and the answer is yes. Uh. Um, and it's, it's multifactorial. <laughs> um, it's the it, you know, weight changes that are normal mm -hmm. and associated with pregnancy. It's also the hormones. Progesterone is, is known to have a role in that. So um, number of pregnancies is a risk factor for developing varicose veins. Okay. I should remind viewers that during this segment, you are free to ask questions and leave comments in the comment section. We already have a couple. Um, we're going to get to the treatment, which I know one of the treatments is compression socks, but we already have a question about what should a person look for in the type of compression socks. Does it matter the type of vein that you have? 
she look for a certain brand what's the cheapest best one to get yeah yeah it's a good it's a good question and it's not a simple straightforward mm -hmm. answer so when we think about compression we can think a lot of different things we have elastic compression which are compression stockings we can think of inelastic compression which are basically just a firm casing we can have compression wraps um, if you do have vein disease we really recommend a couple of things number one that you're fitted for your compression socks okay. this is one of the most important things so the over-the-counter compression socks that we maybe go just get at our local drugstore mm -hmm. are often less than 15 millimeters of mercury in strength and so for people that have significant vein disease this isn't strong enough so we need to actually have our legs measured to okay. make sure that the stockings fit and then the strength we want is a minimum of 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Do you do the measurement here? We absolutely do the measurement awesome. here. Awesome. Good yeah. to know. Uh, what's the most common age range or is there an age range when people start to notice veins more? It's a really interesting question. So we do know that as we get older, our risk factor goes up for developing varicose veins. Mm -hmm. But I've had patients in their teenage years that have varicose veins. And so you really can develop them at any point in your life. And so, um, but we know that as you get older, your risk increases a little bit. Okay, another question. This uh, viewer has spider veins. Should mm -hmm. she be worried about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have people all the time that say, I have spider veins. Do I have deeper vein disease? Is this significant? And the truth is about the majority of people who have just spider or reticular veins, so those smaller veins on the surface, about 60% of them don't have any underlying vein disease. And so um, that leaves a, still a large percentage that do have underlying vein okay. disease. So this is when we start to think about the symptoms and the bigger picture. So are you noticing that you're having swelling of your ankles mm. towards the end of the day? Um, do you have heaviness of your legs, aching of the legs? Are you noticing the skin changes around the ankles, um, ulcerations in those areas? So those can be other signs and things that we would look with for to see see if you may have varicose vein disease. Okay, that was a tie to another question. Yeah. She wanted to know if the veins cause swelling. So she must have some issues with swelling and veins can absolutely contribute to that. Yeah, veins can contribute to it. So it's, uh, there are a lot of things that can cause swelling in our legs. It's not just sure. veins, your lymphatics can, any history of trauma in those legs. If you have an, a really acute episode of swelling in your legs, then we would want to potentially look at things like a deep vein thrombosis or clots or other things that can cause a really kind of very fast onset swelling associated with a lot of pain. So um, heart failure can be associated with it, kidney failure. So veins are not the only thing that lead to swelling, but they're definitely one of the most common things that lead to, lead to swelling. Okay. So that's one of the things that we look at in our evaluation. What about um, certain professions? I, I read that you know if you do too much standing, you can have an issue. If you do too much sitting, you can, so it's kind of like the the extreme of both. So you need to just get up and get movement. Is that some of your advice? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, any profession that is on their feet for long periods of time or at the desk for long periods of time, mm -hmm. essentially what we want to do is we want to activate the muscles in our leg and specifically our calves. Okay. And what that does is that actually helps act as a pump to move blood flow back to the heart. So it helps our veins work better. So anything right. where we're not moving around, uh, we're not activating those muscle pumps and getting the blood flow back to our heart. So that puts us at risk. Okay. Um, another viewer wanted to know if there are helpful supplements that would help with the circulation. Yeah, this is something that comes up all the time. Okay. Patients want to know, is there anything that I can take that can help my, my veins? And I think that the verdict is not completely out on that. There mm -hmm. are many kind of over the herbal remedies that people have, have tried. Uh, horse chestnut seed extract has shown maybe some evidence to be a little bit of a venotonic, so it helps kind of make the veins a little bit smaller so they're not so enlarged. Uh, flavonoids have been tried and, and in some studies. Um, pentoxyphylin, another medication, that, it's a prescription medication, but has shown to maybe increase the healing of ulcers in the legs. Mm -hmm. I think the, the the take home message is that nothing has great evidence that it significantly helps our veins as far as supplements go. Okay, but the movement is the movement. probably the number one thing we can control. Exercise and the and, diet. And, and the weight. Yep. Okay. Yeah, those are important things. Diet and exercise yeah. always. Yeah. Everything gets attributed back. Um, so, how are varicose veins diagnosed? I mean, for those especially that you can't visibly see on the surface of the skin. Yeah. So, the, you know, myself and my partner, Dr. Ashley Wysong, have a comprehensive vein clinic here in the 
in the dermatology clinic. Um, and we evaluate the, the entire patient. And so when they come in, well, the first thing we would do is we would, uh, we would sit down and we would talk. We would talk about risk factors, family history of varicose veins, symptoms that you may be having with your veins, what's bothering you, mm-hmm. have you noticed any changes? And so go through a really detailed medical history. And then we'd, we'd take a really close look at the, at the legs and see if there are any surface changes that we see. Are there any enlarged veins, abnormalities, bulging um, of the veins that maybe increase when we're, we're standing. Mm-hmm. Um, we evaluate the arterial system. And so those would be the first kind of things that we think about. And then if we do have suspicion that you may have deeper vein disease, then we do what we call a duplex ultrasound. And okay. so this is um, a study that many people have done to evaluate for clots in their legs. And that's a little bit of a different exam. So when you're just evaluating for clots in your legs, they're looking at the deep veins, which are below the muscles, and they're looking to see if there are any clots there. But the exam that we do is a very very detailed exam that looks at both the deep veins but also the superficial veins above the muscles. And it looks at a number of things. It looks at the size of the veins, Mm -hmm. looks at the direction of blood flow in the veins. Um, And so these are things that can really help guide us and gives us a lot of information as what is causing your symptoms, are your veins contributing to it, and uh, what things may potentially help you. Okay, Um, we're getting already to the point that people wanna know how they can get fixed. Is there an operating room component involved? I think people are a little hesitant about how invasive the treatment is. So I read about there's laser ablation, there's chemical ablation, there's all kinds of different ways to treat, but can you kind of take a consumer through how long that might take and how non-invasive it is for someone to go through that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great, that's a great question. So historically we would go to the operating room and and strip large truncal abnormal veins. And so you would be put to sleep and make little nicks along the leg and remove those. Those have been largely replaced by office-based perfume procedures Mm -hmm. um, that we do here in the outpatient clinic under local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So you're fully awake during these procedures. You walk in, you walk out after these procedures. Same day? Same day. Same day. That's awesome. And so uh, we come up with a customized treatment plan and both Dr. Weisong and myself perform a number of different procedures based on the unique needs of the patient. Um, One of them that we do, if you have large abnormal veins in the kind of the main superficial veins in your legs, we do what we call endovenous laser ablation. And so this is a type of therapy where it's done here, done in the office, it's done under local anesthesia. We use ultrasound to identify the abnormal vein put in a little local numbing medicine, we gain access to that vein, and we essentially put a wire and laser into that vein and then heat the walls of the vein Mm. to close down the abnormal, unhealthy vein. And what this does is this pushes blood flow to our healthier veins and improves the circulation in our leg. Um, The most important thing after that procedure is you you get up and walk an hour afterwards. So um, just to reduce the risk of clots. But- And once that vein, dumb question by me, once that vein is closed, it's no more. It's closed. All right. Yeah, the closure rates are about 98% over five years of closure with the endovenous laser ablation. All right. Um, Another thing I learned from doing a little research before this, the team at Nebraska Medicine is certified by the American Board of Venolymphatic Medicine. Mm -hmm. That sounds important. Can you explain to me what that means? Um, So the American Board of Venolymphatic Medicine is, is an organization that was developed for physicians who specialize in vein disease. And both Dr. Ashley Weisong and myself um, have completed additional fellowship training in varicose vein disease. And what that means is that we have done um, uh, hundreds and thousands of of these procedures. And that's one of the requirements to to be certified. Um, Then you also, there's a national certification exam that that goes along with certification. And then continuing education requirements that, so for specialists that are, are really involved in and motivated to kind of push forward the field of phlebology or or vein disease. Okay, wonderful. Um, One last question that came in. They wanted to know roughly how long of a process it would be to have veins treated. I assume it depends on the type of vein, but the procedure you were talking about earlier that you do the laser treatment, again, you're in and out the same day. Yes, yeah, so it it depends for every patient, but for a a laser procedure, you're here for probably about an hour and a half to two hours total. Um, The endovenous chemical ablations where we 
chemically shut down the abnormal veins uh, is a little bit shorter, about 45 minutes that, that you're here. It usually requires a series of procedures, mm -hmm. um, but again, they, these are all done while you're fully awake, so you walk okay. in and walk out. Well, this has been one of our most interactive Facebook live chats. Who knew? Who knew there was such an interest in varicose veins? There you go. <laughs> Do you have anything else you'd like to add today? No, I appreciate this opportunity. Okay. It was great talking with well, you. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to give another thanks to Dr. Sutton for joining us today. To schedule an appointment with one of our dermatology specialists, you can call 800-922-0000. And remember, you can always find information on NebraskaMed.com. Thank you for joining us.